Our story continues. Chapter 14 Achilleo stirred. He did not wake, for the suggestion of waking itself referred to sleep, which was an impossibility for one in his state. Yet, he had not been conscious. As the archer slowly pushed his face from the muddy jungle soil, he wondered what had happened to him. Achilleos recalled the tentacles of the Triune's demonic servant starting to pull him asunder. But after that, it was all blank. Thinking of the beast, he leapt to his feet. Achilleos gave thanks that, despite the lurid tales he had heard as a child, he was at least a very agile, dead man. He supposed he should be grateful to the dragon for that. But in some ways, being so near to alive, and yet not, left a bitter coldness inside. Near to alive was not the same as being alive. Then, memory of what he was actually doing in this part of the jungle came back to him. Achilleo spun around to face Hashir, but the edge of the city closest to his location was in ruins. He stared without blinking, another habit of the living he no longer required, trying to decipher just how long it had been since the destruction. The gates, the walls surrounding them, those had been smashed as if by giant fists. Within, two of the triple towers had been destroyed, one not even visible anymore from his point of view. The sole remaining tower, Dialens, if Achilleos was not mistaken, leaned precariously. A hint of smoke rose from the area below the towers. This destruction happened at least a day. Maybe two, Achilleos estimated. Hopefully, no more than that. Yet, even that was too long. She would not be here. At first chance, she would have ordered Odysseus' followers on. But to where? He no longer understood her plan. Not that any of it mattered that much to him now. Only one thing was of importance to the hunter no matter what Tragul or Rathma might insist otherwise. Cerinthia, his Cerinthia, had been possessed by the damned demoness. At the thought of what Lilith had done, Achilleo seized up his bow. He imagined Odysseus's treacherous lover in his sight. An arrow through the heart. An arrow imbued with the magic of the serpentine dragon. But that would mean slaying Cerinthia as well. Despite what he knew they would insist, Achilleos felt that there had to be another way. Cerinthia was not dead. Her flesh peeled off so neatly by demonic magic so that Lilith could parade in it. No, the woman he loved was still there, albeit deep asleep. Somehow, she had to be stirred awake so that she could battle Lilith from within while others fought the demoness from without. Somehow. First, you've got to track her down, you dolt. He had no idea how much of a head start Odysseus' followers had, or whether they were proceeding to the same destination as originally intended. All Achilleos could do was what he did best. Follow his target. It was daytime, which meant that the living were about. However great the devastation on his end of Hashir, the common folk would still need to eke out a living, be it hunting, farming, or fishing. Achilleos was grateful that no one had come across his body, lest he find himself forced to dig out yet another grave, or worse, trying desperately to douse the fires of a pyre. His lone encounter with one of the locals had been enough to make Achilleos wary of any repeat. He was too recognizably dead, even on his feet. Equally frustrating was the fact that Thanks to his collapse, he had more dirt than ever caked on his body. A quick attempt to brush some of that away had proven nearly as futile as removing the original coating. It seemed that the soil in general believed that Achilleos belonged to it, and refused to give up attempting to put him under again. He would not allow it to do that, until he had done everything he could for his beloved. Like a shadow, the hunter slipped through the jungle around Hashir. Twice, he came across some of the inhabitants, but they were slow of wit compared to him, and Achilleos readily avoided detection. 
he finally managed to reach the area beyond the ruined gate where he hoped that he would find clues to those he sought. That actually proved easier than he thought. The Adirum had grown in numbers again, so much so that the trail they left was like that of a herd of the giant animals with the snake-like noses that the lowlanders used for some chores, or rode almost like horses. Even a blind man could have followed the mass exodus he confronted. But what surprised him was that they were not headed, as they should have been, on the route that would take them to the main temple. Instead, they were veering even farther south, to an area he knew nothing about. What was Lilith up to? Achilleo shoved on. Whatever it was did not ultimately matter. He would catch up to them no matter where they journeyed. Hopefully, by then he would have some plan. They are returning. Those three words cheered Mendel more than he could have imagined. He looked up from the task the dragon had set for him, learning how to even better focus his will through the astonishing dagger. It had been going surprisingly well. He was amazed at his inherent ability to manipulate the tool, especially considering how short a time it had been his. But now, all interest in the blade vanished as he stood up and looked around. Where? Where? And suddenly, Odyssean and Rathma stood before him. His brother appeared as relieved as he. The sons of Diomedes hugged one another while Rathma gazed on stone-faced and a sense of amusement radiated from the celestial serpent. The many images of life continually flashed into and out of view as the creature undulated. Be not so disdainful of familial affection, my good Rathma. Tragul remarked so that all could sense him. My experience with such has not been the best, and you should know that. Mendeln and Aldisian separated. The first thing out of Aldisian's mouth was, Serinthia, Lilith's possessed her. It happened before Hashir. As I also understand it. Although at first, I feared that she had been slain like Master Ethan. Mendeln gave the starry being a short look of frustration for that temporary shock. Still, Serinthia's current situation was not all that much better. We must find a way to force the demoness out. That will not be so simple, interjected Rathma. I know of old how tight my mother can cling to that which is of use to her, as you might also recall, Uldissian Uldiomed. Uldissian bared his teeth at the tall figure. I don't give a damn. I've got to save her, and the others too. At the very least, they need to be warned. Rathma looked to the dragon. Drag? Her influence is already mounting. Odyssean is weakened in the eyes of his Idirum. And whose fault is that? Mendeln's brother roared. He shook a fist at the stars. Who took me away? Who kept me from going to her? Had you returned immediately, in the condition that you were in, she would have easily subdued you. He speaks the truth, Rathma added. She had already infested you with her darkness. A return to Lilith at that time would have only served to allow her to complete her spell. Mendeln understood just what they were saying, but felt the need to defend his sibling. Why could we have not done more then? You should understand better than that, returned Lilith's son bluntly. Dragul cannot be known to exist, neither by my dear parents, nor the burning hells or high heavens. For the greater good of all sanctuary, and for its very survival. He must always be hidden from their sight in order to help make certain that the world remains in balance. Rathma took a breath, then added, As for me, my fate lies elsewhere, 
as I have known all along. I can say no more. It was hardly an answer to satisfy Mendeln, much less Aldisian, but both had come to know that they would get no more from Rathma. In fact, Aldisian was clearly growing impatient to do something, anything. Mendeln had seen his brother like this on a few rare occasions, and feared what would happen if they delayed further. All is not without hope, he started to tell Aldisian. There is another, who is even now. But he got no further. Aldisian blurted, Small wonder that Enorius and the demons have been able to play with our world for so long. You do nothing but interfere with those who are no danger to you and stand idled against those most of a threat. Mendeln put a calming hand on his brother's shoulder. Aldisian. But the older sibling ignored the younger. Tell me, Rathma. Did we accomplish anything with the World Stone? Has anything changed? Most certainly, but how much must be deduced by careful observation? I've observed enough! I hold. Although Tragul's outburst happened only within them, it was as if thunder had just exploded. Even Rathma clutched his head in pain from the loudness. The angel is active. Those words brought the three others to attention. Odysseus glanced at Mendeln, who indicated he should instead study Rathma. The pale figure was, if anything, more pale than ever. Yet it was not fear that Mendeln sensed in the other. Rather, he believed it something more akin to resignation. It is settled, then. Rathma said, That is your choice. I have always said that. No, it is my father's choice. Never mind. Rathma eyed the two mortals. <sighs> but perhaps, perhaps I have been overanalyzing. Perhaps... His narrow eyes narrowed further as they focused on Aldisian. Mendeln's brother vanished. What did you do? Mendeln demanded. He could not sense Odyssean anywhere. I sent him where he needed to be. Loyalty stirred within the younger brother. Then I shall go with- No, I will need you for the confrontation. Rathma's resignation grew more pronounced. I trust you've been educating him swiftly, Drak. As much as can be done. You are not bound to this. Ah, but I am. Come, Mendeln. While suspecting that he had no choice in the matter, Mendeln still wanted to know into what he was being forced. And where do you take me? When I would be at my brother's side. Where? Rathma spread his cloak wide. His look, now that of death itself. I would take you to the place. I would rather be farthest from. I would... No. I must. I'm sorry to say. Bring you with me. To stand before my loving father. Odyssean stood in the jungle. At first, he welcomed the sight. Rathma had finally given in and sent him where he needed to be. Then, Odysseus noticed that he was once more missing Mendeln. He shook a fist at the thick canopy above. Damn you again, Rathma. You're no better than those you disclaim as your parents. But neither Lilith's son nor the great beast responded. Odysseus concentrated on Mendeln, trying to first draw his brother to him. And then, when that failed, attempting to return to the emptiness that was Tragul's domain. But still, nothing happened. Before Odysseus could consider what else to try, Odysseus sent something that completely took his attention from his brother. Cerinthia, Lilith, both of them were nearby. Aware that for the moment there was nothing that he could do for Mendeln, Odysseus immediately focused on the new situation. 
trust Rathma to throw him into the thick of things. Why was Lilith's son not here to deal with his mother? What could be more important than that? But that could not be a concern for Odysseus. What mattered at the moment was to make certain that the demoness did not sense his presence, throwing everything he could into shielding himself from her sight and hoping that he knew what he was doing. Odysseus cautiously moved on. If it was to be him alone against his former lover, then so be it. He would not let her continue her evil. It was nightfall now, something that at first disconcerted him. Time in the dragon's realm seemed to pass oddly. He had expected it to be much earlier in the day. Still, the cover of darkness would surely assist Odysseus, who wanted to stay out of sight of his followers until he could gauge what influence Lilith might have already had on them. While it was tempting to confront her in front of the others, Odysseus doubted that such a maneuver would work in his favor. With Lilith, it was best to render her harmless first, somehow. Only then could he worry about the rest of the problem. As he approached the encampment, it was evident that the ranks of the Adirum had swollen since Hashir, something that did not please Odysseus as it might have once. Most of the newcomers would be of Lilith's making. Although he wondered how she had accomplished that, the fact that the demoness had chosen him for her dupe had made him assume that she needed him to easier awaken the gifts within other humans, but the large number of new Adirum Odysseus sensed gave the lie to that. So it seemed. Odysseus circled the area, surreptitiously seeking evidence of Lilith without her noticing him in turn. He did not have complete faith in his ability to stay hidden from her for very long. The jungle sloped down, giving him at last a fairly good view of the main part of the encampment. He gazed with only the barest interest at the hodgepodge of tents, blankets, and lean-tos. Somehow, he doubted that Lilith would deign to sleep in one of those. Still, he knew that she had to be close. A structure in the very midst of the Adirum made Odysseus freeze. A large stone building illuminated by torches stood before him. At first, he thought it some old hunter's lodge. But as Odysseus eyed the building further, he noted more than just the sharply pointed doorframe and the oddly angled roof. The fluted columns, the scrollwork on the door, they all added up to one thing, albeit smaller and more ancient than any he had seen before. This was obviously some sort of temple. Even as that registered, his eyes, augmented by him to see well in the night, caught sight of something that further chilled his blood. There was a relief of Cerinthia's face atop the entrance. Her expression was that of a glorious and understanding goddess, not a human woman. Even though the face looked as if it had always been a part of the building, clearly it was new. He understood immediately what it meant. Through Cerinthia, Lilith was creating a cult, focusing on her. In fact, although Odysseus could not be entirely certain from his vantage point, it seemed that the more he studied Cerinthia's face, the more there appeared subtle hints of another mixed with her features. And then he recognized to whom they belonged. Lilith. It was obvious that she already intended to make herself their mistress in body as well as spirit. At some point, she could then cast off Cerinthia's form, perhaps even return as Lilia somehow. Fighting his smoldering anger, Odysseus wondered about the ancient temple. It could not be a coincidence that had brought Lilith to it. She did not work that way. This structure had been her intended destination. That realization further sent a chill running through Odysseus. Something was to happen here, something integral to the demoness's desires. Most of the Adirum began settling down for the night, no doubt exhausted from their arduous trek. There were more sentries than ever, far more than should have been warranted. More disturbing to Odysseus was their manner, which seemed colder and wary of even their slumbering comrades. The guards were a mix of Parthens and Lowlanders, some recognizable by face to him. Most were male, but a few women, equally dark of expression, also walked among them. Even without trying, Odysseus could sense a shadow over their souls, a taint that bespoke of Lilith. Without warning, one of the sentries glanced in his direction. Biting back an epithet, Odysseus strengthened his shield and backed deeper into the jungle. 
Frowning, the guard took a step toward his hiding place. You see nothing. Uldissian thought at the man. Merely the jungle. It was all your imagination. He had never attempted to influence another in such a manner, and hoped that by attempting to do so, he did not give himself away. The sentry stood looking for a moment more, then grunted and returned to his post. Slipping farther on, Odyssean berated himself for his carelessness. He had come too close to revealing his presence, and to a guard. Had it been Lilith, surely Odyssean would have been discovered. Was Lilith inside the temple? Unable to sense her properly, Odyssean could only assume so. Taking the utmost precautions, he tried harder to probe the structure. Tried, and quickly failed. There was a shroud of sorts around it, making whatever was going on inside undetectable by anyone, even him. That only served to make Odyssean even more anxious. What would Lilith desire so much to hide, even as she insisted that it took place, surrounded by those with the potential to sense it? He feared he had some idea, and that forced a decision upon him. Lilith surely could not act until most of her followers were sleeping. If Odysseus could reach the building undetected, there was a sudden movement to his left. He barely secreted himself in time to avoid being seen by a figure passing by. Odysseus caught his breath as he recognized the bald man striding at the edge of the camp. Romus. Odysseus dared not let the moment slip away. Concentrating, the son of Diomedes reached out to the Parthen. Romus smothered a gasp. With casual movements, he turned toward the jungle then slipped out of sight of the camp. A breath later, the two men faced one another. Romus could not hide his startlement. Master Odysseus, we thought you did. Where were you? He hesitated, then added, It is you, and not some phantom. Yes? It's me. Praise be, Romus. You, of all people, I could use now. The former brigand blinked, then returned. I am at your service, Master Odysseus, surely. Nodding in gratitude, Odysseus pulled his companion farther away from the camp. First, I must know something, Romus. How did the Adirum fare in Hashir? It was a bloody thing. The temple had magic and might greater than we could have imagined. I... There were some lost, Master Odysseus. Tomo among them. Tomo. Odysseus mourned all those slain, but he had come to know eager Tomo better than many. How fares Saren? He sworn to avenge his cousin's death with a hundred of the Triunes when next we come upon them. The blood kept flowing. Odysseus blamed himself but he also blamed beings like Lilith, Inarius, and Rathma for thinking so little of mortal life. They would pay. They would all pay, with Lilith first. That brought him back to another question that had to be answered quickly. That ancient structure. How does it come to be that you're all here, near it, and not on your way to the main temple? Romus's face lit up. To a Sorinthia. She had a vision and saw this place. Such a new and wonderful power. Even you've never had that, have you, Master Odysseus? No. Odysseus doubted that any of the Adirum had experienced such an ability or possibly ever would. No. And I fear that neither has Sorinthia. What do you mean? Romus, has she... As Serinthia seemed different. Different? The bald man shrugged. When you vanished, she took up the struggle and saved many of us who might have joined Tomo. She brought spirit back to us, Master Odysseus. When we thought you were no more, Lilith had done her work well. Judging by Romus's rapt expression and marveling tone, Odysseus had returned just in time. He took the man by the shoulders. 
Romus had come far from the disreputable figure that had watched him from far across the Parthen Square. Listen to me. Nothing is what it seems. You believe that Cerinthia has been guiding all of you since my disappearance. I, of course. Vehemently shaking his head, Odysseus went on. You're all being tricked, Romus. That is Cerinthia in body in there, yes. But what you hear and see is the work of a demon. The sister of the foul Lucian. You know of whom I speak. The Adirum's visage clouded. You speak of Lilith, of whom we've all heard. Aye. Can it be true that you're saying Cerinthia's her in disguise? It can't be. She possesses Cerinthia. Cerinthia is there, deep in slumber. What you've seen, what you've experienced. I promise you, Romus, that the true Cerinthia would have nothing to do with it. Nothing. I. Romus looked down in thought. Odysseus could not give him the luxury of digesting all of this. Romus. Romus. Is Cerinthia inside that place? Aye. She should be. Do you know what she plans there? The Adirum shook his head. Nay. But I, and some others, are to come to her near midnight. Sir, she says that there is a matter of import for us to discuss. The sentries I saw, have they had special contact with her? After Romus nodded, Odysseus explained, We must be wary of them. They may be under her spell. It's to be us two alone then, Master Odysseus. You can be trusting in me. Romus's tone all but pleaded for Odysseus to believe in him. Odysseus not only believed in him, but Romus unfortunately needed to play a pivotal role. He could still get near Lilith without being suspected. Odysseus required the former brigand to distract Lilith enough so that he could then strike at her while her defenses were down. He explained such to Romus, then asked if the man was still willing, what he knew of the building. "'Tis an old chapel, or monk's abode,' she said," Romus answered. "'Sir, and she told us it was a sign that we were directed to it, said it would mark the beginning of a turn for all of us." Again, Odysseus felt a cold chill. "'Would she see you before the time she requested?' I could find reason, Master Odysseus. The Parthen shivered. <sighs> Poor Serindia. If you can keep the demoness from noticing, I'll make my way in. Then you leave. But what about you? For what Odysseus had in mind, he wanted no one else near. It was possible that forcing Lilith from Serindia would wreak destruction on the immediate vicinity. Just get as far away as possible. Understand? Romus reluctantly nodded. They talked over the details a minute or two more. Then, with a short bow, he returned to the camp. Odysseus had kept their plan as simple as possible, aware how even the slightest complications could worsen the situation several times over. Romus did not immediately go to the temple. As dictated, he first found reason to speak with the nearest sentries and direct them elsewhere. Odysseus did not wish to be forced to injure any of them simply because they had been entranced by Lilith. By the time Romus had dealt with the guards, night had well established itself and from most corners of the encampment there came only silence. Many fires had all but died down. A few glow lights hovered around the area, a hint of the growing proficiency of the Adirum. Fortunately, most of the lights were dim, the better for their creators to sleep. At last, Romus headed toward the ancient structure. The two Edirum standing duty hesitated only a moment before admitting him. As one of the most senior of Odysseus' followers, Romus was probably now second in command. That made his inclusion in Odysseus' plan invaluable. The thick wooden door creaked closed behind the bald man. Odysseus counted under his breath, giving Romus time to establish his conversation with the false Cerinthia. According to the Parthen, until tonight's impending gathering, she had intended to be alone. Finally, Odysseus deemed that enough time had passed. Any longer, 
and he risked Romus' life. There remained only the two guards, both of whom eyed the area before them with a distrust amplified by Lilith's hold over them. Not wishing to hurt anyone unnecessarily, Odyssean concentrated on the two men, then slipped toward them. The guards continued to stare ahead. They now neither heard nor saw anything. Even when he hurried past them, they did not move. There was no other entrance to the building, the only other openings being small air slits well above. But Romus had explained that there was an outer chamber before the one in which Lilith had arranged her sanctum. All Oldysian needed to do was reach it. Then, there would be no more reason for stealth, only for swiftness. He would have one chance, and one only. At his direction, the door opened just enough to admit him. Odysseus muffled any creak, lest the demoness be warned by even that. The chamber he entered was utterly empty. Whatever decor or artifacts likely long removed by thieves or the departing builders, Odysseus cared not for what use the edifice had been, only that voices rose from the room beyond. Romus's and Cerinthia's. And yes, Romus, we'll soon be on our way to the Triune's main temple. I swore by Odysseus' death that I'd complete his quest. First the Triune, and then definitely the Cathedral of Light, who may be an enemy worse than those we now fight. I apologize again, the Parthen responded to her, but I too wish to fulfill Master Odysseus' legacy. I thank you for reassuring me. Not at all. Is there anything else? Odysseus dared risk Romus no longer, aware that he also did not wish to harm Cerinthia's body. The son of Diomedes threw all his will into repeating what he had done to the guards outside. He fixed on the feminine voice. A silence enshrouded the building. A silence finally broken by a gasp from Romus. Master Odysseus, she does not move. She stands as if a statue. Odysseus entered. The first thing he noted was Cerinthia, as beautiful as he remembered her, poised like a goddess with one hand extended to Romus. A beguiling smile that had never been worn by the merchant's daughter gave ample proof that Lilith was in truth within the woman. Then, a second, more awful sight behind her attracted his attention. An altar. An altar stained by centuries-old blood. He might have thought it merely macabre coincidence, but atop the gray stone slab had been set a long dagger and a goblet. Worse, there were also runes drawn on the stained surface. Runes freshly made. Tonight, the altar would have drunken for the first time in generations. Despite the risk of Lilith escaping his power, Odysseus could not help but look up. Above the altar, the face of whatever spirit or demon that had been carved there had been artfully replaced by that unsettling combination of the two females, with a bit more of Lilith recognizable. Master Odysseus? Romus's pensive voice finally brought him back to the present. The Parthen stepped back as Odysseus faced the frozen figure. Up close, Odysseus could see the tiny hints that the woman with whom he had grown up was not truly there. Besides the smile, the eyes had a harsh cunning that he recognized too well. It's over, Lilith, he breathed. Odysseus put his palms on the woman's temples. He was not certain what he needed to do, but if he could reach Cerinthia, somehow he felt that she would help him force the demoness out. It's all over. Something hard cracked against the back of his head. The world spun about. Through blurred eyes, he saw Romus leaning toward him the Parthen with a fanatical expression and a heavy stone apparently taken from somewhere in the chamber in his hands. The fresh blood on one end of the stone belonged to Odysseus. You will not hurt my Lilith, Romus snapped, his face twisting into something evil. You will not. And as Odysseus collapsed, he heard Cerinthia's voice and Lilith's all too familiar laugh. <laughs> Well done, my love, just as we planned. <laughs>